Welcome to Season 4 of The Great Humbling. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a futurist, a poet, and a recovering sustainability consultant. In the spring of 2020, during the first lockdown, I began recording a series of conversations with Dougal Hine, co-founder of a school called Home. We started with a question. What if it makes sense to think of ourselves as living in a time of humbling, being laid low, brought down to earth. Pulling on that thread has taken us further and become more central to our work than either of us expected. So we're back now with an open-ended series as part of the wider patchwork of homewardbound.org. Thank you for listening. Well, here we are back once again and with a new rhythm for this fourth series I'll say more about that in a minute. But to start with, we're going to be doing these episodes monthly instead of weekly. So hopefully that gives us a little more time to breathe. And as a couple of listeners have mentioned, a little more time to follow up on the books and articles and things that we talk about each time. So, Ed, how was your summer? Suitably humbling? (laughs) <laughs> well, yes. So, uh, so I've been burrowing back down into the Norfolk landscape, um, enjoying being immersed in the turning of the seasons here, uh, watching as my little muddy river Chet has blossomed and bloomed, uh, it sort of filled with yellow water lilies and their pads. And then it narrowed as the wild watercress encroached into the stream and the laurels and willows were draping their heavy leafed branches down to tickle the gently trickling surface. And, uh, and now as autumn begins to bite and I, didn't you didn't you use a Swedish word, uh, back endish? Oh well, I think that's a Yorkshire word. It's something my mum always says anyway. <laughs> right. So so in the back endish time of the year, there's the retreat, you know, the dieback and the mulching of all that verdant vegetation. Um and it got me thinking that, you know, I've just been facilitating one of our Forward Institute responsible leadership residentials at Sandhurst of all places, uh, which is always an intriguing backdrop with this grand stately home-like presence of the old college in its country estate style setting with all the expansive landscaping lakes and grazing geese and woodland um, against the soundscape of small arms fire on the ranges. And I, and I borrowed an exercise from my colleague, the brilliant Carol Campaign, um, who's founder and executive director of the Diversity Practice. And she uses a, a seasonal map to interpret how your responsible leadership practice is evolving. And it's quite straightforward. You know, you use this sort of quadrant of spring, well, like what's emerging, what are the new green shoots, summer, what's blooming, what's in floral technicolor for you. Uh, and then the back endish autumn, you know, what do I need to give up uh, or relinquish or let fall away? And then winter is, is not what needs to die, as I originally guessed. <laughs> but uh, what can I see clearly now that the leaves have dropped? You know, what does the clarity of the remaining branches tell you? And I and I really love the seasonality of that simple exercise. And it's actually really revealing. Well, I like that a lot. What can I see clearly now? The leaves have gone. And the leaves are all across our growing beds here in Sweden just now as we put the garden to bed for the winter. And meanwhile, we've got the, uh, the, the heavy machinery rumbling along down across the road from us at the bottom of the garden that we might might get a little bit of intrusion from in the course of the recording as they're building a new health center across the road from us but yeah i like that uh, that way of framing the seasons a lot ed i'm also loving the intimacy of this place i mean i had a couple of school of myth friends visit over the summer andy and joe jukes and they were staying in this tiny thatched wooden hut amongst the reeds of hickling broad and they're self-declared mountain people from shropshire you know joe's just written a book on iron age hill forts and and they confessed to me that they'd been not a little bit apprehensive about a holiday in the flat badlands of East Anglia without the usual rocks and peaks and panoramas and vistas they love. But funny enough, both were deeply struck by the way the low topography of the land here holds you close. You know, there's no huge scale flamboyance of vast scenery and you're compelled into a much more immediate connection with the damp soil beneath your feet as you nestle between the reeds and trees and these avian insect and mammal visitors that bumble through or buzz around or sweep briefly overhead. And it's a much more proximal relationship 
you know, a humbler one even. And that's what's been really live for me too. And I guess the only other thing to mention is is our pet mute swans um, who have also been intriguing me. Now, they're daily visitors for my daughter's leftover crusts. Um, and the regular ritual of feeding them as they hiss away below the deck of the mill has been a real grounding. And I thought there were a couple of boys, as they both seem to have this pronounced black cob above their beaks, which distinguishes the male swan. And so I'd christened them Barry and Dave. And then a month ago, they both disappeared for a couple of weeks. And I was a bit concerned. So I was keeping an eye out for them on other parts of the river when I was out for a walk. But there was no sign. And then last week, they returned with a signet. <laughs> and it's like... It's a little late in the season, but they've obviously either had a chick themselves or adopted an almost fledged chick as their own or one of their gang. But then when I was researching gender identification in swans, as you do, I discovered that lifelong homosexual pairings are not uncommon in swans. And that wasn't the surprising bit because, you know, I'd heard of the book Biological Exuberance, which describes all the instances of homosexuality in nature and, hey, it's all natural. What did surprise me, however, was to learn that female swans often mate with gay male pairs and then donate the fertilised egg or eggs. And then the gay male pairs incubate, hatch and raise the chicks. And even more amazingly, they're better at it. Um, 80% of gay male swan pairs successfully raise chicks compared to 30% of male female pairings. And apparently that's down to more equitable workload sharing and accessing better nesting sites and territories. But who knew? Wow. So, yes, it's been a marvellously humbling summer of reconnection, exploration and discovery on the Chet River at the Mill of Impermanence. Well, yeah, that's quite a trip through your summer, Ed. Thank you for that. Now, I've got to confess, summer feels a long way away by now up here, but it is, it's very good to be back. And before we went away, in the, in the later episodes of the last series, I mentioned this thread I've been pulling on about the role of the great humbling within a, I guess, a, a greater ecosystem. And the way that what the two of us do here fits together with the, the Homeward Bound live series that I started teaching around the same time we made the first series of the podcast. And I should probably say at this point, we've got a new series of Homeward Bound live getting underway in the second week of November. But yeah, I have had a desire to join these things up and to make room for bringing in more voices and publishing more work from the community that's been growing up around all of this. And part of it, too, I guess, is that I've always loved editing and curating and bringing together an unexpected mix of voices and ideas. And I had 10 years of doing that with Dark Mountain. And in the time since I handed on the reins there, I've missed that privilege of being able to give a home to pieces of writing that I want to see out there in the world. I've been feeling the itch to be an editor again. So as we're recording this in mid-October, I'm basically giving myself a deadline. By the time this episode is edited and out there, it will have a home as part of homewardbound.org. For a while, we were calling it an online journal from a school called Home. But in all honesty, I couldn't get excited about the idea that the world needs another online journal. <laughs> and then one morning I thought, what it actually is, is the commonplace book of a school called Home. And we can talk about this idea of the commonplace in a future episode, but it feels like an appropriately humble banner under which to bring these things together. It's not staking a claim to being a big, important platform. It's a cottage industry. It's a gathering around a campfire in one of the internet's dark forests. But in giving it a visible online home like this, I hope we're making that campfire a little easier to find your way to and making room for a few more voices among the public traces of the conversations that are already happening around it. Hmm. That just makes me both grateful that is. There is that little flickering beacon amongst the impenetrably twisted trees. And it reminds me, I don't have enough wood smoke and convivial conversation in my life. But then, you know, can you have too much? I don't know, probably. <laughs> but my neighbours had a bonfire yesterday afternoon and the evocative waft of ever so slightly sulfurous smoke hung in the air. And, and I learned a new word, phantosmia. I think I'm saying that right. 
when you smell odours that aren't actually present, which is sort of olfactory hallucination. And I occasionally get that with bonfires, which perhaps speaks of that deeper need for burning and gathering. So the other thing I've been doing since the summer is recording the audiobook of Hospicing Modernity by Vanessa Machado de Oliveira, or Vanessa Andriotti, as many of our listeners will know her. In fact, I'm talking to you from the little studio under the stairs in the Red House here in Ostevola that I built in order to do that recording, although you wouldn't quite believe the soundproofing when the the tractors are going along out there. We were quite lucky they didn't start work on the build until after the audiobook work was finished. But we talked about this book quite a bit already during our last series. I'm glad to say the print edition is now out. And the audio version is available for pre-order in the places where you get your audiobooks. But basically, for several weeks, I was spending a part of each afternoon in the studio here, voicing Vanessa's words. And some of the stories in the book come from the experiences of her life. And these are things that are very far from my experience. Being a teenage mother in Brazil, doing a degree in evening classes while working 58 hours a week in three different jobs being a university professor and seeing police harassing a young indigenous man on your own campus and fearing to intervene because of the likelihood you'll be arrested yourself because you don't look like a university professor. Having colleagues ask you who you had to sleep with to get so many papers published. Having colleagues disbelieve you when you talk about your experience of racism at the university. Having them assume you're exaggerating or or making it up. Mm. And that's not the only thing that the the book is about but those kind of stories are threaded through it mm, i've just started reading it and it's, it really is quite a piece of work naturally knowing you've done the audiobook makes it doubly weird because hearing i'm now hearing vanessa's words as i read it in your voice well yeah it it felt like a serious thing to be entrusted with these stories and i actually had a conversation with vanessa about this last week as we were wrapping up the work on the audiobook we've got a plan to do a sort of one-off podcast together for Homeward Bound where we'll go into this some more together. Because what struck me was, first off, I doubt if there are any publishers out there right now who would think of asking a white English guy to voice a book by a woman of colour from the Global South. Mm. Uh, It was very much the author's choice in this case. But secondly, I want to say what a powerful experience it was to speak these words aloud, in the first person, to have them come out of my body. Far more powerful than just reading them in a book or listening to someone else read them. And it made me think that there's something here a lot of us would benefit from, having to read aloud the words of people who have experienced things that lie a long way outside of our own experience. Mm, Indeed. I also recently read Nova Reads, the the good ally uh, on how to tackle systemic racism, um, how to take people from being bystanders to change makers. And there are so many insightful lessons along precisely those lines uh, that you're just describing and what is a really warm, compassionate, but actually seriously challenging book. And what Nova does is artfully articulate the abdication of responsibility, often inadvertently and subconsciously, that's deployed by white privilege when defending microaggressions, when we hide behind the defence of good intentions. And it's the much deeper empathy for others' experience, you know, without denial or disavowal, that both Vanessa and Nova describe that is essential if we are to connect more profoundly from different perspectives. And as Vanessa says in her book, words make worlds. And perhaps by reading her words, you've tuned in far more viscerally to her world. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to make any grand claims about that. I just want to report that it took me by surprise quite how powerful that experience was. And visceral is absolutely the word. It's feeling in the guts some fraction of how it has been to live a life that starts from conditions very different to the ones that you or I grew up taking for granted. Mm. Yeah, it was while interviewing Nova for our Future Notes podcast on the future of race that I was forced to confront some difficult chapters from my own past and we were talking about how racism is learned um, and and children as young as three or four already demonstrate these culturally embedded racial biases and it it sort of forced me to 
recall an incident related to me by my late father when I was probably five or six and we'd gone to visit West Indian friends of his in London uh, and I was happily playing beside the kitchen table with the daughter of the family when I announced in flawed innocence to my father's abject horror and embarrassment and the family's no doubt world weary familiarity you know you're an n-word aren't you I've never met an n-word before and and you know we can sadly attribute that awkward moment obviously to a monocultural upbringing in 1970s Norfolk but I share that uncomfortable anecdote because it sort of leads us into this episode's theme confessions so yeah as always I will do my etymological thing but to confess comes from the Latin confiteri which is to acknowledge uh, in which the con brings the intensive force and the fiteri is to declare or avow Uh, And confession is all about the revealing of personal facts we might rather keep hidden, Um, often obviously in a moral or religiously sinful or legal context, Uh, although it can also be positive, as in a confession of love. But the key to confession is the honest exposure of the unseen, the unperceived or unknown. And in that sense, confession can actually be a relief because it liberates us from the anxiety of keeping those dark or dirty secrets. Uh, confessions can be preemptive. We get our confessions in first, perhaps when the prospect of being found out or mm. discovered is high. So a bit of sort of moral hedging. But the act itself is also powerful in relieving feelings of guilt or in actively seeking forgiveness, which is a bond building process in itself. Now, Confessions should obviously ideally be voluntary (laughs) because forced confession is essentially torture, whether it's mentally, emotional or physical. Uh, But I had to laugh two years ago at the height of XR's creative actions of October 2019 when a friend in the midst of it all messaged me saying, I have a vision of you dressed as a priest with a mobile confessional booth, listening to people's environmental transgressions in a process of repentance and atonement. Uh, What she didn't know was that in the early noughties, I'd co-created the Earthly Sins confessional booth with my old mate, Cindy Rhodes, uh, who had founded the events-based activism group Anti-Apathy. And yeah, and I'd donned a green dog collar, and we spent a happy decade as an installation in Glastonbury's Greenfields, bearing witness to punters' various different ecological misbehaviours, offering absolution through practical action and solutions. Now, our thesis, although I don't want to over-intellectualise the playfulness of this, was that guilt is a barrier, uh, and by alleviating it through vocalising it, we hopefully help to unlock people a little from their paralysis. Uh, I mean, that said, we had some pretty colourful confessions from eating whale to burning sofas in the woods uh, and occasional forays into sort of psychosexual admissions that we were way beyond our pay grade to deal with. So in the light of that, Dougal, I'm slipping on my metaphorical dog collar. The old frontispiece of the Earthly Sins confessional booth, which I carved with a Dremel multi-tool, is hanging on the wall behind me. Do you have anything you wish to confess? I feel like we ought to be on Craggy Island here. Father <laughs> Ed and Father Dougal. <laughs> but yeah, I do have a confession to make. And this is taking me back to the summer, to the days of early August, because I missed a climate change conference because I got on a plane and flew to Mallorca for a week at an all-inclusive hotel. That's so you. It was what I can only describe <laughs> as an emergency holiday. Uh, it's like we've it's not we've gone on holiday by mistake. It's uh, we've come on holiday because it's an emergency. Uh, it's not it's not something I imagine I'll be doing again in a hurry. And I can't pretend I was comfortable about doing it. And I can't say that I knew what else to do under the circumstances. So to give you the scene, this is six months after we moved into the new home and school here in Astavola and. I'd spent the earlier weeks of the summer working with our carpenter friend, Jack, relaying one end of the roof of the Red House and rebuilding the outside wall. And and that's been grand. But we also started late and it's run on into the summer holidays. And, oh, yeah, we've had loads of visitors coming to see the school. and, And suddenly we just hit this wall. We were at a place of total exhaustion as a family and desperately in need of a week in which no one had to think about making dinner 
were basically taking any decisions whatsoever. And uh, yeah, in this slightly hallucinatory state, we booked this holiday leaving the next Tuesday. And here, okay, here's one of the lessons that maybe I can draw from this experience. Because if I think about what was needed so we didn't end up flying to Mallorca, it wasn't at the moment when we made that decision that something needed to be different. Mm. It was weeks and months earlier when we planned our summer so that we didn't end up at that place of collective exhaustion. So next summer, the rule is we take a break before we end up broken. Mm. I'm, I've been quoting a, a classic Buddhist quote recently, which is the wise learn from the past, but the brave learn from the future. Hmm. So the anticipation of that brokenness. But yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm with you. Aviation based confessions are obviously always close to my slow travel heart. <laughs> uh, we used to get confessees to chalk their confessions on a small a blackboard and, and then take a photo of them holding it in front of the earthly sins confessional booth and stop long flights to love horse was a memorable one <laughs> which definitely needed the contextual backstory from the woman who wrote it who who flew home regularly to reconnect with her childhood pony in its dotage okay i'm glad you explained that a little bit more than just the, the <laughs> slogan on the, the sign but um i mean here's something i noticed having not been in an airport in years traveled through stockholm Orlando, and there are posters everywhere advertising a future of fossil free flying uh, which as far as i can tell is in complete fantasy and there are stickers over the wall sockets everywhere saying 100 percent renewable electricity so there's clearly a lot of angst about flying being anticipated by the people who are running the system at least in a country like sweden yeah they definitely want to ram the message home uh, it's, it, it's weird i had a similar experience returning to london for the first time in months uh, earlier than summer and i was struck by not just the the kind of the green advertising but just the overwhelming advertising everywhere which is obviously something i'd clearly been at least consciously inured to during my 25 years of residence there though lord knows what was going on subliminally and i realized in norfolk i barely ever even see an advert that's really interesting. Do you know, that brings me back to when I was in my mid-20s and I spent six months living in Xinjiang in the far west of China. And one of the things that struck me after the first few weeks was just the kind of the silence of my mental space as I went around mm. a city where I couldn't read any of the words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then one day I actually took a bus to the end of the line and set off walking into the villages outside of the city and spent an afternoon there, met a family where we couldn't speak any of each other's languages, but just spent a bit of time together in their orchard. And and then as I came back into the city that night, I was hit by the loudness of all of the signs mm. and the adverts everywhere, even though I still couldn't <laughs> read them. But a few weeks after we got back from that trip to Mallorca, I found myself driving down to Copenhagen, which is basically a thousand mile round trip from here. Because my parents, who we hadn't seen in nearly two years, were due to, to travel over to come and you know, spend a couple of weeks with us to see their grandson again, having not seen him since he was four and now he's six. And you know, I'm sure so many people listening to us can relate to that from mm. their own family experiences over the last couple of years. And basically three days before they were due to fly in to Sweden, uh, we found out that they would be refused entry coming directly from the UK, but that by some weird logic of Kafka in the time of COVID, if they flew into <laughs> Copenhagen and I picked them up and drove them over the bridge, that would be totally okay. That's fine. <laughs> and actually, in the end, it felt like it felt very appropriate to do this sort of mad road trip, driving this huge distance across the country, seeing parts of Sweden I've never seen before, certainly parts of it that my parents had never seen before. And and to share that reunion in that rather liminal context of a long shared mm. drive together rather than just fitting in, picking them up at the airport between a morning meeting and uh, an afternoon uh, school pickup. But I have to admit, when I started thinking about wanting to confess about the trip to Mallorca, I didn't feel any of the same anguish about my parents getting on a 
a plane to come over and be together with us as a family. I just felt this deep gratitude about you know, being able to see them again after this long time. Mm. Uh, George Mumbai always refers to those type of trips as the love miles. Oh, bless George, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think he um, says the love miles are what are going to kill the planet, doesn't he, just to ram it <laughs> home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, what you give with one hand, you take away with the other. Um, well, I mean, I've also got a bit of aviation atonement to seek. Um, you know, I flew to Barcelona two weeks ago to give a talk, and I've made my name as a sort of recognised non-flyer for a decade and a half or more now, actually, because uh, I, I gave up flying several years, even before my only planet flight-free circumnavigation of the world. And I, I went to Barcelona for a gig I'd accepted in early 2020, pre-pandemic, and actually before I became a full-time single dad. Uh, and the event had been rolled over to this October, and normally I would always take the train to a European event like that. But full-time single fatherhood just makes that extra time away completely impractical, actually pretty much impossible. So I had to honour the contract, and I flew, and it brought all my old concerns um flooding back you know the incomparable cost you know the supposed convenience the the practice of hypermobility that was so bluntly interrupted by covid and the self-justification of my own importance to be honest you know it's hardly very humble i must fly to barcelona because this talk is world changing so the experience has pretty much brought me to the conclusion that my international gigging days are probably over for the foreseeable future. Mm. You know, I'm not going to use my parental responsibilities to justify getting a plane to talk to audiences about the future because, <laughs> frankly, there's a dark irony in that. And so unless I could take my daughter with me on the train, which is a brilliant adventure for her, and we took the Riviera Sleeper to Cornwall this summer and she absolutely loved it. So I'm going to politely decline future invitations uh, and, and stay closer to the ground and my home ground. And that feels really good to share <laughs> in a confessional sense. Yeah. Um, and it feels like a weight off my chest. But any other weights to get off your chest, Mr. Hine? Or should I say Father Dougald? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, having started down this route, okay, I, I want to confess that I quite often find myself having sympathy for people you're not meant to have sympathy for. <laughs> and this goes back to that airport experience because when you arrive at Stockholm Arlanda Airport you find yourself walking past this endless wall of Ericsson adverts each with the slogan the quest for easy <laughs> if you could feel a hug from a world away who would you hold if 5G can turn drones into lifeguards how else will it elevate emergency response will the term lost exist in a world of connected cargo if we can enable plants to talk, what else could mobile communication do for our planet? <laughs> I'm, I'm walking past these posters, uh, wondering about easy as a goal. And I have to confess, I find myself sympathising with the anti-5G campaigners. Not with all the alternative science and the theories about 5G being a plot to brainwash us or COVID being really a result of 5G masts being switched on. But there is some underlying intuition that the beaming of high-speed internet into every corner of the world, Elon Musk's train of satellites tracking across the sky like a Morse code readout, that there's, there's something sinister about this and about the world that we're being offered. Bigger, better, faster, more. Obsolete. <laughs> That's the old uh, Howie's t-shirt I used to own, put it. Uh, I think... I think there's a justification in that sense of unease. Uh, a friend, a friend shared an image of a ghost robotics robo dog, uh, with a gun mounted on its back last week, oh, yeah. which, you know, is beyond a sort of Charlie Brooker black mirror type of scenario portrayed as the future of unmanned warfare. And it's like my future notes, compadre Mark Stevenson always puts it. He goes, technology is a question. It's not an answer. Uh, and it can often seem like we're completely befuddled and actually supine in the teeth of the searching questions that the potential technologies of tomorrow are asking us, you know, whether it's the all pervasive 5G you describe or canine death bots. Yeah, I mean, there's something here that maybe we can dig deeper into in the months ahead, because 
I found myself thinking a lot about how positions that I do not hold and that I do not want to affirm in the literal sense in which they're generally expressed can nonetheless contain a difficult truth at an intuitive level. You know, I have to confess, I've often felt a kind of sympathy for the real climate change deniers, not the evil corporate operators who are using the tobacco industry's playbook to generate confusion in the name of profit. But I'm thinking of these old white men, and they are almost always old white men, who Mm. are contorting themselves to explain to anyone who will listen how climate change is a conspiracy. Because the thing is, I think somewhere in there, they get what it would actually cost to take climate change seriously. How much it is going to cost us, and not just in money terms, Mm. but how much we're going to have to surrender of our desires and our entitlements. Whereas When I hear the kind of slick talk about win-win-win technological solutions and green growth that still dominates lots of the conversations from people who profess to accept the reality of climate science, it feels to me like we're further detached from reality there Mm. than at a climate deniers conference. And clearly, I say this from a position of no moral high ground whatsoever, as we already established, but it is how things look from my vantage point all the same. And now I'm going to go off and say my Hail Marys. But, <laughs> Ed, how about you? Any, any last confessions left to make? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just ruminating on that honesty gap that you've basically painted there because I think that I think it's right. Um, and I've been saying that in my talks recently as well as I quoting the junior doctor, Adam Kay, you know, who wrote this book here called This Is Going to Hurt. Um, it's like there is an honesty gap in terms of that, uh, discrepancy between the reality uh, and the techno optimism, um, that we've touched on before. But, um, I guess I'm left pondering the potential power of a richer confessional culture. Um, not just in that slightly obsessive, you know, self-centered mindfulness fashion of introspection, although clearly there's, there's some potency in that too, but only up to a point but rather um, a sort of collective cultural confession. Uh, As Vanessa talks about in Hospicing Modernity, you know, what better place and venue for lifelong heartfelt confessions than in the hospice? I mean, where else would you make those sort of confessions? And I listened to a podcast by another of our favourite Indigenous thinkers, Tyson Yunkaporta, the other day, uh, who was interviewing a brilliant old friend of mine, Ada Paris, about her ideas around cyborg shamanism. which is another great conversation we might return to. Uh, but one of midlife's rare pleasures is to get to read books and listen into chats like this from people you know, love and respect. And reading Felix Marquardt's The New Nomads that you've mentioned before on this podcast was another recent treat. Anyway, on this podcast, Tyson said this typically simple, brilliant thing right at the start of their entertaining chat. And he said, essentially, as an individual, you're not special. You're not even that interesting. It's almost certainly not fabulous. And it's not about your personal purpose, you know, your manifest destiny, your unique genius, which is something many of our modern Western ways of thinking and, you know, executive coaching and self-development and professionalism would have us believe. Tyson just said, you know, you are your relationships, you know, from the myriad symbiotic interdependencies of your own internal and external flora and fauna but also your family, your friends, your connection to kith and place that we've been talking about in this episode and your professional interactions. And of course, that much wider kin of the non-human world, the earth, water, fire, air and fiery, far-flung starts. And Tyson just said, you know, modernity is effectively concreted over all of that, but it's still there. And he had this great quote, he just said, move with the land or the land will move you. I just thought maybe we need to culturally fess up to reveal some of those dark and dirty secrets of our own mundanity uh, beyond the hubris of some elements of humanity to seek reconnection and forgiveness and atonement humbly, actually, to forge a new collective bond together. You know what that got me thinking of, Ed, is Raymond Panikkar, who was a fascinating man. He was a Catholic priest and in some sense as well, a Hindu. He has this line, we are knots within nets of relations. Like The self is not this thing that then 
shows up and begins to enter into relations with everybody else. The self only exists as a knot in this tangle, in this fabric. And I always felt that takes the the pressure off that the, there is a loneliness and an unbearable weight in the notion of individuality that's taken for granted by modern Western cultures. And so, yeah, maybe we do need to find ways of confessing to each other the gap between the burden that we've expected ourselves to bear and what we're actually capable of, the gap between the story we've told about what kinds of things we are and what our experiences, our bodies, our lives, our lands are telling us. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. If you'd like to follow the threads in our conversations further, head over to homewardbound.org. We will also find my substack, Writing Home. You'll find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Cool on Twitter. We're always glad to hear from those of you who are listening, and we're deeply grateful for all that our listeners do to spread the word and bring these conversations to new ears by sharing the podcast along your networks and giving it ratings or reviews on the platforms where you listen. These are strange and humbling times, and we need quiet corners, breathing spaces, air pockets and pockets of resistance, places in which to puzzle through how we got here and where we might be going. Thank you for helping us create one of those pockets.